and uh, welcome to the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge. I'm the host of the Football Network World's weekly online discussions with football practitioners from around the world. Um, today we're discussing the importance of understanding individuals of coaches with Anthony Ferguson, the head of coaching at Wimbledon, Drew Broughton, the high performance coach, and Jamal Campbell-Rice, is a player coach at Colchester under 23s. Hi guys, how are you all doing today? Good, very well. Thanks for much. Yes, all good, all good. Before I uh, introduce all three of you properly to our audience today, I um, just want to share with them sort of the structure for today's discussion and uh, how they can uh, send their questions through to you. So today we're... Um, the importance of understanding individuals. We're kind of splitting the discussion into sort of three distinct areas. Um, and to ask uh, Anthony, Jamal and Drew questions around the topic, if you could use the Q&A tab at the, uh, the bottom of your, your Zoom screen and kind of filter the questions through in these three significant areas. So sort of to begin with, we'll be chatting about the three guys' experiences as players and that self-awareness of of themselves, of players, and what their strengths were and their interactions with coaches there. Um, so that'd be good, kind of like in the first 20 odd minutes. So the first 20 minutes, you sort of focus your questions in and on that area. And then we'll sort of move on to sort of ask them as coaches and how they get to know and understand their players, sort of methods for doing that. And then in the final third, we'll sort of, yeah, sort of understanding themselves as coaches. And what are the processes you need to go through to sort of really understand your own philosophy, sort of maintain, be able to get that across to the people you coach. So again, if you could use the Q&A tabs to fill those questions through for the guys and we'll get through as many of those as we possibly can. Uh, so we can do that. Let me uh, stop sharing that screen and uh, yeah, start introducing you to the guys. So um, we'll start with Anthony. Anthony Ferguson. Um, yeah, just wanted to begin with Anthony, but you just tell us sort of how old were you when you were first sort of spotted and sort of came into a pro football academy? Hi, Steve. Thanks very much for having me on the show today. Yeah, yeah. Welcome. Thank you very much, Drew and uh, Jamal and everybody listening. Um, initially, um, it started off in school, as most people, and then playing for district side, which was Newham at the time, and then Redbridge because I changed schools. Uh, and then went to county, and I was lucky enough to play some g games as a county player. And then I got invited down to Fulham um, for a trial. And uh, I think at 13 years old, when they told you that you're going on trial at, you know, what was a first division club, as we called it at the time, it was the greatest thing in the world. Um, I'll be honest with you, I went, I played, um, I thought it went okay. And then afterwards, they gave us uh, bread and butter and tea. Now. I don't eat white bread, I don't eat butter, and I don't drink tea. So <laughs> that was almost a determining factor and took away from the football, um, which I think was really, really important because a couple of years later, I was lucky enough to go to uh, Luton. Um, I, I was lucky enough to, to play quite a few games in the youth teams. And then I went to Watford. So I went from uh, David Pleat uh, to Graham Taylor. And for those of you that know both of them, what wonderful and, and consistent people they were who acted with great integrity, but they were always insistent on hard work. Um, I had a car accident um, quite early in my career because I was still non-contract. Um, and that basically that car accident put me in hospital for pretty much four and a half months in Homerton Hospital, for those of you that know it. And uh, basically that was the end of my, my career because I never actually got to sign a, a full contract. Uh, after that, and I think after two years of not having anything to do with the game, um, I started playing semi-professional football at various clubs. And where I'd been used to receiving the ball on the ground, um, I was now in a world of watching the ball maybe 30 foot up in the, in the air. Um, and that was just hard to manage, hard to deal with, because I felt like I was just doing doggies. Um, so the non... Um, the non-league stuff, I played at about, I think, four or five different clubs, which includes, you know, Wingate and Finchley, but also Leighton and Redbridge at the time, before they became Dagenham and Redbridge, uh, Leighton Football Club, Leighton Pennant, 
captain. I was all over the place. Um, and it was, it was tough because I felt, I felt like I'd never sort of maximised my potential. Um, and then I got invited on a trial uh, back at a pro club um, where Joe, Joe Jordan was working. And, and they talked about their pre-season doing a lot of running. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, not for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I always saw running as a punishment. So I hope that just gives you a little spectre of where we've been. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I don't know whether sort of just to add on top of that, sort of then where is that journey then taking you to where you are now in terms of how you then sort of became a coach? Just kind of just brief, briefly just list it. Obviously, we'll get into the detail as we, as we move on. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I started doing some work locally in grassroots with my, my brother's team. Um, and I, I'd say purely by accident, but I don't know, believe in accident because I think God leads everything. Um, I happened to be walking across the road one day and someone who had played against at Tottenham at the time, uh, Steve Grenfell, invited me down to come and do some work in their community. Um, I did some work in the community and absolutely really enjoyed it. Um, and then within a period of time, I then started working in the academy. Um, I started off with the younger age groups and worked my way through the age groups right up to under 17s and 19s as they were known and then obviously it got changed to under 16s and 18s uh, with the likes of uh, this Gary Izzard who's at uh, Crystal Palace now, uh, people like Jimmy Neighbour, God rest his soul, Patsy Holland and people like that and Mickey Hazard who I can't forget. So that was a great experience and I left in 2003 stroke 2004 and ended up going down the road to do some work with uh, Liam Brady and the guys down at Arsenal. And then I got shipped over to Bangladesh to work in their um, National Sports and Education Institute, working with their elite players and then their national under 17s team. And then came back to take up an opportunity up in the Northeast. I won't say exactly where it was, but in the period of coming back, the manager got sacked. And everybody who was supposed to be in that team was obviously no longer required, as they would say. So I ended up, as fate would have it, um, working with someone who I classify as a mentor, uh, Les Howie, at the FA. And then, as a subsequence to that, ended up working with someone who I deeply regard as one of the best coaches I've ever worked with, Noel Blake, um, working with the under-17s, 18s, 19s. Um, and then went into coach education, coach development, where I was up until um, last year. Um, and now at AFC Wimbledon. Fantastic. Thanks, Anthony. I'm um, going to move over to um, Drew Broughton. How are you today, Drew? Sorry, unmute myself. I'm very well, thanks, Steve. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Uh, yeah, I sort of wonder if you could yeah, very briefly take us through a sort of similar career path for you, sort of where, where it began as a, as a youngster and sort of, yeah, just, just in terms of a list the places where you've stopped off in the last 20, 30, 30 yeah. years. I hope I'm not being too rude by sort of going as far as 30 years. And I think it is, yeah, 27. Um, Seven-year-old, fell in love, Mexico 86, um, Maradona, watching that at home on the TV, um, fell in love with the game. Many young boys do. Started playing, started practicing all the time. Played well for my Sunday club. Uh, the manager at my Sunday morning club was area scout, for Norwich City at the time. So, you know, said to me, if you keep doing what you're doing, scoring all these goals, I'll get you a trial there. So at uh, 10, I got a trial with Norwich City. So uh, not a trial, I got sent for half term. Back then there was no academy. So it was a Tuesday night training in Stevenage at the age of 14, which I was in Milton Keynes at the time. So kind of a midway point. But yeah, holidays, uh, every holiday, I'll be up to Norwich, Canary Cup, caravans. Uh, we, we had a brilliant set up there. And we travelled all over Europe playing all these tournaments from Sweden to Germany to Austria, Denmark, Brazil. Incredible experience. So between the age of 10 and 14, I was, I was, I was at Norwich City and then associate schoolboy forms at 14 where it gets a little bit more serious. Um, travelling up to Norwich at weekends. So I'd get the train from Milton Keynes by myself in through London, meet all the Welsh and Bristol boys at Liverpool Street, over to Norwich, play a game, come back. And of course, you get offered the, the, the YTS. So... Started my YTS at Norwich. Um, we had a great side. We won the league. Myself, Bellamy, Adrian Forbes, Rob Green, the goalkeeper. An incredible side. Beat, beat West Ham's side to the title that year, which was Lampard and Ferdinand's year. Um, 
nine of us got pro contracts. I broke into the team, first team, uh, just after a year into my YTS, about 14 months in, scoring loads of goals. And uh, there was injuries in the first team. They were at the top of the championship at the time. Martin O'Neill was manager. People will have forgotten that. But he, he, he left at the Christmas at Norwich City, came back to get them back in the Premier League. So I had my debut, um, played a little bit towards the end of the season, scored in my debut at Wolves, um, was in the England youth teams, uh, went to the Youth World Cup with the under-20s in Malaysia. I was in a squad of 26 with Owen and all these guys. And, uh, I got flown back from, from base camp. Two of us didn't make the final 26 or 24 where it was cut, so I flew back. But it was a great experience. And what it said to me, even though I didn't anchor to it, was that, wow, I'm 17 and a half, 18, and I'm considered in England's elite 26 players right now. I was playing in the first team, signed a three-year contract with, with Adidas, which was quite lucrative. I think at the time, I believe it was only myself and Kieran Dyer signed a really, really good money deal with Adidas. So, you know, again, looking back, I couldn't at the time, but actually that gratitude for the position I must have been in. Within a year of the debut, uh, I was struggling, in the reserve, struggling. Um, management changed, Bruce Riot came in. I'm a young guy trying to figure it out. Uh, and I was just drowning a bit. Manager called me in, said, look, Brentford want to sign you. Um, so I signed for Brentford, uh, three and a half year deal, get my career going, um, dropping down from Norwich in the Premier League, got promoted, so drop, dropping down at that time. What I saw as dropping down because I had no idea of how tough it was. Um, within four weeks of a three and a half year deal, Ron Nose calls me in. I'd gone there to get my career going. He signed eight centre forwards, myself, Lloyd Owusu, Fortune West. So it was like, I've come here to get it started. Called me in and said, look, Barry Fry wanted to take you to Peterborough originally. He just rang me up, said he'll take over the three and a half year contract. So I'm, I'm, I'm 19 in Richmond in a bed sit flat. Went down to Peterborough, took that contract over. Rest is history, played to 33, fighting to find form across about 20 clubs, across the divisions, generally League One, League Two. Um, just fighting to find form. 33, uh, relegated with Lincoln City from the Football League. Probably their most experienced player, top paid player. I took a lot of that burden on myself um, and was just really struggling during that period. Uh, marriage broke down, went to rehab, sporting chance. Um, life was a mess at that point. And here I am, what, 41 and a half now. So how many years ago was that? Nearly eight and a half years since I walked into sporting chance. You know, didn't have anything, sleeping in my car, 80 grand worth of debt. I was in a mess. So where I am today, my life transformed. Came out of there, I'd studied, luckily I'd studied human movement for four or five years, injuries. Got passionate about it after repetitive hip and hamstring issues. Um, studied differently, studied with faster education, Gary Gray in the States, a lot of online learning. So even though I came out of Sporting Chance, my life was a mess on the outside to people. I was incredibly, it was an amazing place internally and I had this skill set. So I had about eight Premier League mates, I rang them all. They all gave me a bit of banter. You know, to be fair, Drew, one thing you were as a good pro, what do you know? Well, look, guys, I've studied this stuff. Drew, my knee's killing me. I have injections every month just to play games, my back. Went to work at their houses, drove down there, gave them two hours, tool-assisted, myofascial scraping, hands-on at the feet and hips, driving, different stuff. All of them trained that afternoon or the next morning and went, mate, I felt completely different. I said, yeah, well, things aren't moving in the right sequence. And started a business. They went, right, I want you once a week. I want you twice a week. How much, do I how much do I charge you guys? Well, I'll typically, Drew, at this level, we pay this for this. Cool. Set a business up. Within 18 months, we're turning over £200,000. We had about 30 players a week between my partner and I, from Harry Kane, Oxlade Chamberlain, Wilcott, Gibbs, Toure, all privately at the houses, uh, under the radar. Had calls from physios. What are you doing with our players? Was it really open, honest every time? Look, guys, you know as well as I do, they outsource everything. You know, and the senior players would be very strong with the physio. So unless you're going to pay my mortgage and pick up my appearance money, be quiet. I've I'm, I'm got my guy. And when you hear the stories about Ibrahimovic at Man United, no one was allowed to touch him apart from his guys. So the top guys had their own people. I knew that. So I knew there was a niche. Ran that hard for four years. A lot of mileage. Had to be from Nathaniel Klein's down in, in Southampton at the time, back up to Liverpool to see a player in the same day. Slept hotels, whatever it took. Um, loved it. Loved being around the players, loved, got a buzz from solving injury issues that were close to surgery. But then it got to a point, I thought, this is not me, this is not. And my business partner at that time was tired of it. We were trying to set up a high performance centre in London. 
couldn't make the numbers work, too expensive. So we parted ways. I kept a few of the guys bubbling over to, 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 you know, because the income was good and then just fell into it. My brother was academy director at Norwich City at the time, rang me and said, one of our youth team players, we tipped for the future, knocked on the door, wants to quit, he's depressed. Um, bolt out of the blue for us all. History of him working with a club sports psychologist. I just shared with his dad that you'd been through loads of stuff, Drew. Could you have a chat with him and his dad? Off the record, it's no problem, mate. So had a chat, he identified with everything I felt. Um, and I said, let's, let's start. He didn't quit. And that's, that was the beginning. Then working with Matt Wallace at the time, a golfer who was dealing with his hip issues. And I was training him physically. I was his physical trainer. He came to see me and said, I don't want to train today, mate. I've missed the last three cuts. I'm done. Um, we had a chat and a coffee. We played the next week. He won. Matt's now, well, it's got to be world top 20, 30 um, on, on the tour, on the PJ tour. So I started to think, mm, there's some value in this. Didn't have a business doing it. My money was coming from the physical stuff. And it just came exactly like Anthony's. I've got huge faith. And, and things just started, people just started to come to me. Journal, I knew a lot of journalists. If I was at the under 21s the other night speaking to this father. His son's struggling, locking himself in his bedroom. He's at Chelsea or he's at Liverpool. So it just grew. So now I look after today, look after eight footballers. They pay me a monthly retainer. My work is done via WhatsApp, voice notes, on the way to training, after training. I watch their games on Y Scout, looking for two things. I'm wildly intense. <laughs> Always have been, but I can walk that line. I'm looking at intensity and I'm looking at courage. And the courage might be to ignore everything your coach says if he's got fear and you haven't. So they're the two things I'm watching. I've had calls from dressing rooms an hour before kickoff, huddled in toilets. Assistant managers told me this, this, this and this. Good, you're going to ignore everything, okay? Everything he said you will ignore. If your instinct is stronger than his fear, it is. Go and do what you do. Um, so that's my working week on, on call. And two years ago, I started social media. So I now work at three businesses. Um, I work a day a week or half a day a week, at, at, at all of them looking at culture, trying to get performance with the sales teams, feelings, emotions, vulnerability, um, being absolutely honest, uh, leaving the ego at the door. So yeah, I'm very, very blessed. So that's my working week today. Three companies, eight players, a bit of speaking and and that's me. Sorry to ramble on. No, no, that's great, great, Drew. That's sort of yeah. So we got the uh, we got the uh, the the, uh, the sort of skeleton there. We'll start putting some flesh on those bones uh, as we as we progress through the session. Um, Jamal, uh, we'll sort of move slowly to yourself. Um, how are you today? Yeah, I'm fantastic. Thanks for having me. I mean, um, what two fantastic stories there from Drew and Anthony and. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to follow that. Um, you said uh, got the skeletons there. That was skeleton, bones, flesh, meat, <laughs> everything. And then two stories. I'm not sure I can, I can, I can quite follow that. But, um, but yeah, um, my career, I started quite late. I know Drew said he started off at, fell in love with the game at the age of seven. Like, um, God, I probably started 13, 14. Like, had no interest in, in playing football whatsoever. Um, lucky enough, from a from a young age, I always knew that I was quick. I was more into athletics and running. Um, I was fit as a fiddle. I was a scrawny little kid. Um, to be fair, I'm not much bigger now. Um, but uh, yeah, I fell into fell into football at the age of 13, 14, just playing for my school. Um, then then playing playing for my borough, and for my borough, I ended up getting scouted for Millwall. Um, went to one training session there for me, schoolboy forms. Um, my mum was worried about um, the distance uh, coming from a single parent home. Um, we was in West London, obviously Mills in South London, but um, the guy that picked me up, Andy, Andy Sullivan, um, he was brilliant for me. We're still really good friends now. Um, he used to like give me a lift over to Sheen every, every week and all the rest of it. Um, ended up signing YTS forms on the night of, of signing my forms. I got my mum was probably one of the best days of my life signing those YTS forms, not thinking I was going to get them. Um, they'd done a big, big thing at, uh, of an evening at the stadium with, with all the parents and the kids saying, um, obviously, like your kids being offered YT, this, that, and the other, made a big evening of it. By the end of the night, got back in the car, and my mum was like, Listen, boy, you've got a lot of work to do because they said you'll never make it as a player. They just offered you uh, these, these terms just because you're a nice kid. So that was almost like a slap in, slap in the face straight away. Um, anyway, six months into my YT at Millwall, um, Charlton coming for me. I think they paid a nominal fee for me. Went across the way to Charlton, um, which was 
which was fantastic under the under the helm of Mark Robbins, who was a fantastic coach, helped my game so much. Um, Simon Pro um, went on loan a couple of times to Leighton Orient, uh, Chesterfield, Wimbledon when they, they was the original Wimbledon when we were playing at the hockey stadium. Um, Jimmy Gilligan was there; he was brilliant as well. Um, then ended up signing permanently for uh, Rotherham. Um, first time going up north, signing up north and walking into a change room when I was when I was the only black lad there. I've never experienced that before. Obviously, coming from a London, very diverse and all the rest of it. Walking into a change room where me being the only black lad, obviously the banter then was a lot different. And I had to realise I had to make sure I had thick skin and all the rest of it. But it was a, it was brilliant for me. Um, spent what a year and a half there, signed for Southend under my old. He was my manager at the time at Leighton Orient, but he was assistant to Steve Tilson to sign for, sign for Southend, which was brilliant. Got promotion. Um, in that time, while I was there, I, I had to go on loan to Colchester um, because there was at first when I signed for Southend, I went on loan first um, because the two clubs couldn't agree a fee. Um, done half a season on loan. Couldn't agree, still couldn't agree with and ended up going to Colchester, got promotion, which I don't know if many know that I got two promotions that, that year with Southend and Colchester, which um, I'm not sure many people can say that they, they've got. Um, ended up signing for Southend permanently. He was playing in the championship, had a good year. Um, I had a person, had a very good year, signed for Barnsley. Done, I think it was three years there. Fantastic it was uh, under Simon Davey. Um, then from, from Barnes, I went to Bristol City under Gary Johnson. Um, had an indifferent time there, but absolutely loved it. Fantastic city. Probably had a good year and then uh, fell by the wayside a little bit. Ended up at Notts County under Keith Curl, was probably the best manager that I've had. Um, probably not for his coaching skills, but for his man management skills. I thought he was fantastic. He just knew how to handle everyone. And over the course of my 20 year career, I thought, that's the thing that got me the most, not how good of a coach you were, but how good of a person you were. And, and I thought he was fantastic with me, and fantastic with everybody else. Drew, you and I know, and we, we all know that being out of the team is probably the hardest thing in the world. But how we spoke to the boys that were out of the side and all the rest of it, I thought he, it was credit to him. And now he's reaping awards, obviously, finally got a, getting a promotion with, with Northampton. Uh, so, yeah, from there, from, from Knox County, Keith Curl only lasted, I think it was like nine nine months there. And um, then we had a couple of other managers, Sean Derry come in and he was fantastic for me as well. Unbelievable manager. Um, and then a year under him at Notts County, got a move to Sheffield United, um, which, I, which I was absolutely delighted for. Massive club. Delighted that they're in a the Premier League now because they are a Premier League side. Um, done two years there. Um, from Sheffield, went to Barnet. Um, and I, obviously my career was starting to to dip then. Uh, went to League Two my first time there. Um, loved it though, my first time back home in London um, in my whole career, which was, which was nice. Um, then from Barnet, I went to Carlisle back under uh, Keith Curl. Again, he was fantastic for me. I was obviously worried about the distance. But he bait, I was almost like part-time there. After a game, he'd give me off till Thursday looking after my body which was brilliant, obviously, he knew I had a young family. Um, then from there, I went to Stevenage, which wasn't so great. Um, and then from Stevenage, I went to, fell into player coach at, at Colchester, which I had no interest in doing whatsoever. I'd done my B licence in Northern Ireland, I think it was four years ago. Um, I was meant to stay for my A. Um, I got on the, on the flight straight after my B. I was like, no chance on my... My staying another week, I absolutely hated it. I was like, coaching's not for me whatsoever. And then um, that pre-season, after I left Stevenage, I was just training back at Barnet, just keeping fit. I know I know Darren Curry down there, he was like, just listen, just come in and keep ticking over. I just wanted, probably wanted to nick one more year. And then I just got a phone call, do I fancy to play a coach role? It would be more going into coaching, but we just want you to, to share your experiences and what it takes to get into the first team with a 23. So... Um, I was not a part of the first team whatsoever for the last year, um, but going over into the 23s for like it was a frustrating experience, but brilliant. Like, um, and now I absolutely love it. I'm currently on my A license, um, and yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. 
it's a role that I didn't think I'd be into, but yeah, loving every minute of it. Oh, fantastic. Thanks for that, Jamal. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, uh, sort of going through those bios, there's a, a lot of great coaches getting name referenced there. Um, I don't know where to start, so sort of go back to those sort of playing days with each of you and starting with Anthony. Um, I don't know, what kind of go back and kind of what age were you starting to have this consciousness of yourself as an athlete, as a footballer, as a mature person and sort of understanding what your strengths and weaknesses were as one as a player and as, as, a, as a human being and how that interaction was with your coaches. How are your coaches bringing the best out of you? Where were you sort of seeing, well, actually, hold on a moment. They're taking me in a direction which is not good for me. And were you able to sort of deal with that sort of situation at all at any point? Hold on, Anthony, I think you're still on mute, my friend. Sorry. So it's try I was trying to be give the guys some respect and be quiet, just in case. Um, I, I love that question um, because what it does for me, it, it, it takes me to a place of reflection. And uh, one of my colleagues at the FA, Steve Smith, is always talks about how important reflection is and not to forget about the things that we should learn. And my memory goes way back. I mean, my, my good friend, Barry, Barry, Barry Todd, we used to play on the street and the street was the pitch. You know, you'd, you'd, you'd wait for the car to come past and you'd chip it around the bonnet. That was how you learned technique. You know, that was a skill in itself, playing off the curb. Um, so when you then went to school um, and then, you are not me rude, you were the best player because I played with, as a youngster at 11, I was playing with people who were much older than me on a place called Wanstead Flats. And I'm talking about, you know, oh, I don't even want to start naming names because there's so many of them, but people like Wayne Mitchell, Roy Fontaine, you know, Julian Hilaire and Vince Hilaire's brothers, um, people like that just made you a player without coaching. So it, it was like, um, I, I sit down and I think, I used to watch Clyde Best, you know, and he used to like battle his way through games. I used to watch Trevor Brooking and he used to glide and move through games. I used to watch Gordon Hill and how quick he was. And then I literally tried to go out and be all three players in one. But then I would try that against, you know, someone who was five, six, seven years older than me, much better technically, much stronger, much quicker. And I would get kicked to smithereens. And then I'd be told to get up and literally get up and get on with it. So when I now went to play with my peers, it was honestly, it felt like child's play. Um, but then I remember my first football coach who was also doubling up as a PE teacher at school and history teacher, English teacher. And he took us out to play a game one day in East Ham against another school. And it was my very first game, you know, on an 11 aside pitch as an 11 year old, or 10 stroke 11 year old, because I'm an April born. And, <laughs> I'll never forget, I didn't have a pair of boots at the time. And, you know, at those days, if you had a pair of um, anything with a flash on it, if it was Gola, it was great. Anything with any form of color on your boots, you were amazing. But I didn't have any boots at that time. And he gave me a pair of rugby boots. Now, rugby boots at that time had steel toe caps and they almost had running spikes underneath. Okay, so I went to play this game. He brought me on in the second half and I remember the first kick I had was amazing. The ball just sailed through the air into the top, top bins. Only thing was, it was in my own net. <laughs> and so my teammates are shouting at me. And I'll never forget Mr. Kraut saying to me, and it, it, it sticks with me all this time later, Anthony, all I'm going to do next time is turn you around to face the other way. Do what you're doing, son. That has stuck with me since 10 stroke 11 years old. And I think that's what's carried me through. It's believing that if I've got a problem, I'm going to ask the coach. If I've got an issue or something that I don't understand, I'm going to ask. But then if you roll them forwards seven years time, when remembering where I grew up in Newham, there's a football club in Newham, um, which at the time, very well known. I went to play an FA Youth Cup game. I was the only black player on the pitch. And every time I went near the ball, 
there were monkey chants. There were boo, 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 like they used to do. Now, bearing in mind, I used to shop with my mother about 100 yards away from the ground, a place called Green Street Market. And, you know, like I said, certain people on the call mostly would know that. It, that, was, that was hard. That was hard to sort of be on the pitch. And I never remember at half time thinking, I can't do this. And again, this was Graham Taylor. Now, he said, he said listen, you're here for a reason. So when Jamal talks about certain differences in the dressing room and, you know, different experiences, I, I fully understand that. But when he said, you're here for a reason because we believe in you, well, what more can you ask for from the first team manager that's actually putting his arm around you and saying that? And I remember the second half playing the game of my life, putting in challenges from like long distance. You know, if I was not doing long jump or triple jump, you'd think, wow, you should have been an international athlete. So all of that, um, Steve, what it, what it tells me is that the conscientious coach can have a real impact on the player. And the distance that we travel over time, people will never forget. So I, I have this phrase, you know, trust God, be good, do good, be kind. And that's sort of the moral that I'm ask, I ask players to think about when they're going through it but also the triangulation, because it's not just the players, it's the coach, it's the parent, it's the school system, it's the peers, it's absolutely everyone that has a responsibility for supporting the development of any individual. I'm gonna pause there because I'm sure the guys have got some, I've got so much to say on that subject, as you know, and like I said, you know, it's important to, to, to think, how would I feel if? What would happen if, and then start to ask questions in that reflection process of, you know, being a player back in those days was, was difficult. It was hard. Um, one, for opportunity, but two, for the way you were treated. So once you got the opportunity and then you went through the door, it most really was never what you expected it to be. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this because, you know, I talk about, I'll talk about this later in terms of coaching, you know, Graham Keeley, when he was at the FA, again, one of the best managers I've ever worked with, said, do the brilliant basics, treat people as people. And that, that was how he lived. And I've taken that to say, well, that's something that all players want, respect. And like Jamal said, if you're being left out of the team, just have the courtesy to, to, to give some reasons why. Give them some form of development plan or some some form of pathway that allows them to structure what they need to do and then keep that dialogue consistent and continued as opposed to saying one thing the other one day and then no conversation for a period of time. Because I think that's the demoralization. I mean, even Drew, I know Drew would have been through that where someone just doesn't communicate with you. That's worse. That's actually, it's, in fact, it's actually abuse if I think about it. And sorry, I'm going to stop there, Steve. Is that so? Sort of... oh, you've uh, you've teed it up quite nicely for uh, for Drew to step in. Um, That's what we do, Drew. Uh, <laughs> Pass the baton. Uh, with you, Drew. I don't know whether we just kind of sort of trying to begin with focus on that development stage and where you as a as a youth team player, uh, you're sort of getting used to you're sort of getting used to yourself. You know, you're sort of maturing as an adult when you have that sort of understanding of yourself as an athlete as a person what your needs are to make you grow as a person when did that start to happen and how did that conflict possibly with what the coaches were asking with you and then how you sort of deal with that situation so I don't think anything conflicted with what I don't think I ever remember the, co the conflict was Every bit of conflict I ever remember from a coach was because of my needs weren't met. <laughs> what were my needs? Simple, basic human ones. I remember being eight years of age and I felt back then, and it's never left, never left me, it's still there today, but I understand it today. Always felt lonely, a deep loneliness, um, intensity, a drive, which was, I mean, my my disciplinary record, 13 red cards, 100 and odd yellows, yet, yet a really well brought up by a single mother, publicly school educated. I'm a father, I'm a really nice guy. 
but I had this switch in me, which I didn't know how to control, this desire. I was always the alpha male leader type at every club I played with. I can look back and say that now. At the time, I didn't know that. Um, so I remember from a young age, this awareness that there was this ferociousness, this drive, this nothing is ever enough, this relentlessness, which I guess looking back, got me through the age groups, 10, 11, 12, 13, nothing was going to stop me becoming a professional. You know, if we're doing running, I will lap you. I want to humiliate you. It, 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 was, it was in me, this voice. It's still there today. I hear it when I'm running now. I just go, oh, there it is again. You know, it's, 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 it's a great thing if it can be understood and honed and you need humility to do that. So I remember from a young age, just needed to be understood. Um, needed, needed someone to, 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 to tell me who I was to, to help that self-discovery. You know, I had a couple of people along the way that understood that. Um, but just just fighting to be myself. And I remember that, that Norwich City team that I was part of, we were together from the age of 13 to 18. You know, some, you, know you think nine of those guys had careers for, for 10 to 15 years, some of them at the top, top, top level of the game. And there was a group of about four of us in that group, which we were the alpha male types, competitive, hated losing. I watched The Last Dance with Michael Jordan and I laughed because I, I not today, although I would probably have to catch myself, I used to lie a lot about stupid stuff. And they were sitting there, Jordan lied about something crazy. He lied about something in the, some player in the opposition just to almost get himself up for it or to valid. I was doing it all the time, lying about little, because this, this absolute distaste for getting beaten. So my, 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 one of my biggest issues was that, knowing what I could be put, put more pressure on me than anything the game ever did. And I didn't know how to manage that. And I didn't have anybody to ever sit me down and really validate that. So when I went over the line and wanted it too much, their back would be turned very quickly. When I was on the money with wanting it too much and dragging the group up every day in training, I remember I was at a club, 26, in a relegation fight from League Two. A player came on loan in the prem, from the Premier League and, you know, he came down and we had 10 games to go to stay safe. You know, you know, at that point, I was 26, you know, jobs were on the line. I have to, I was on, I think I was on 10 goals. I wanted to get to 15. There were scouts watching from the championship. I knew I was playing up front at the time with Billy Sharp, who was on loan. I knew I had to keep doing what I was doing. We were doing a, a possession before training on the Friday morning. And this lad had his boots undone. He was rocking around in my team, half effort. I said, come on, let's get going. That's a massive game tomorrow. It's huge. Said, we need to be at it first minute of the day. And everyone like, you know, I, that was me. It was, just, it was just me. And he went, oh, calm down, mate. <laughs> and I went, look, come on, let's get going. And the water break came. And I said, look, come on, we've got to get going. I said, massive. We've got 20. Next, next, the next session, keep ball. Let's get, get at it. You're in my team. And he squirted his water bottle at me. I walked over, bang, head butted him. Nose went everywhere. He hit the deck. Now, I say I'm a really nice guy, but this switch, I walk in, Barry Hunter, God bless me, who was manager at the time, he's now Liverpool's chief scout. Baz is like, big man, you can't. And I was, I was probably the main player at the time or one of the main focal points of the team. I'm in the shower going, what am I doing? What, what am I doing? This, you, you come out of the haze and I didn't know what I was doing. And, and, but the problem was after that, I'd get thrown under the bus, you know, You've got serious issues. You've got... But three weeks ago, you were saying, big man, if you can keep this intensity, you drag the rest, they'll follow you. So it's a good, but now you're telling me, so I'm out, I'm done. I'm, I'm just going to go lose myself for a couple of days, I'm done. So that was my, the only guys that have been attracted to my post or ended up working with, a, I, I call them game changers. The, the ability to, to lift the mood, lift the dressing room, can drag it up, can drag it down. When Lincoln City got relegated, I was, it was put on me that I sucked the life out of that dressing room. I probably did. And, and, I, and I rang the manager and made an amends part of my recovery process because I was lost. I was broken by that age. And I was that broken that I couldn't find my form. And they were just shunning me and training me with the, with the kids. And the, that I would just burn that place down. Managers, clueless boys. And I was a big energy, you know. And so that was my, I had self-awareness the whole time, but didn't know how to manage all those so the guys that come with me aren't, aren't just guys making up the squad in football. They're guys who have the potential. One name I'll use because he's come out and said we work together, Steve Colker. You know, Steve, 
an incredible human being. Uh, he's now Turkish Defender of the Year. He will get a move this year back to the Champions League this summer when they finish there. Into, everyone's after him again. 18 months clean and sober from drinking alcohol, uh, alcohol and gambling. And he said to me the other day, he said, mate, I ran down the training crit pitch and grabbed Cissé by the neck. He said, what am I, what is in this head? And I said, welcome, brother. I said, when you were drinking and gambling, you weren't doing that stuff. He goes, no, I didn't care. I said, you gave up. You quit on your emotion. Now you're in your feelings. Got to manage them. I said, but that's the same guy who got Turkish Defender of the Year, so you can use that energy how you want. Like, you know, so it's, I, I tend to work with these, these personalities, powerful. So, yeah, I won't ramble on, Jamal. I'm sorry, buddy. Um, no, you, no, that's all good. It's funny you should say that about Corks, though, mate. I played with him at Bristol City and uh, absolutely fantastic lad, but you could always tell that he had that, that, <laughs> that switch in his head. Like, um, he just, not, I think that, not to say he wasn't all there at times, I think that's the wrong terminology, but you just could, you just knew that like something wasn't Power. always right. And he'd spent, he'd spent, he spent days and hours in, in the casinos. And I used to say, Corks, come on, you've got so much potential. And it's, it's, it's really nice to hear that like you've got him or helped him get back well, on. Yeah, yeah, and yeah and it's, it's all, it's all on him, man. But, but it's fascinating when I, when I, you know, Craig Bellamy turned to me once when I was working on him at Cardiff and Corks walked into the gym he just signed from Spurs and he went, Phew. see that lad? I went, that's Corker, isn't it? He said, he said, honestly, in the Olympics, Ryan Giggs turned to me, he said, he's Rio Ferdinand and then some. He said, yeah. he's the wildest yeah. lad I've ever met. And I was like, oh, man, that's from he, Bellamy. I was like, all right. Yeah, he come, for, he come to Bristol. He, honestly, he was awesome. But like, there was just something that, 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 that wasn't quite right there with him at the time. It's, it's fantastic to hear that he's he, he's he's up and running and back on the street and now. Um, as for yourself, Jamal, was uh, what's your story with that sort of sort of late teen years? You sort of coming into football quite late and sort of yeah, one well, sort of clearly you've got an understanding of yourself as an athlete and then sort of understanding yourself as a footballer and then as a person within that environment and how did that sort of all play out for you? Um, with myself, uh, Steve, as, uh, I became a father really, really young. Um, I had my daughter when I, when I was 17. So straight away, I just thought, listen, I, I need to grow up. I need to man up. I need to provide. And um, like I said, I, I alluded to earlier, like I come from a single parent home. And um, I just wanted my kids to grow up knowing that they have a mother and a father that's there and supportive. So straight away, it was my focus was purely on to provide and that, that, that's, that's what my, my, my drive was to provide for my children. Um, I've got three beautiful kids and um, I've been able to provide for them and, and, and from, from the age of 17 when I knew that, I was, that my daughter was coming, that was my sole focus on to provide. When I got a contract, I was looking for the next contract. When I got that contract, I was looking for the next and my goal in my head was to, I've only ever made it until I've reached 500 games. And lucky enough with like Anthony and Drew said it, they, they believe I've got a strong belief and God's always on my side and all the rest of it. And I, and I thank him for, for the life that he's given me, for my, not just me, for my family as well, that I've been able to provide. But yeah, for me, it was from, from a very young age, from 17, just knowing that I just had to go out and before every game, I bless myself, I bless my kids and to keep me strong, make me perform and all the rest of it. And that was me, that was my driving force. And, and like I said, I've, I've been lucky in, and with God on my side, I've, I've been able to achieve the stuff, the, the, the things that I wanted to achieve. And like, there's so many players out there that have had better careers than me and better players than me and all the rest of it, but I'm proud of what I've achieved. So you should be. I mean, the, um, sort of in the, the promotion for this discussion, Jamal sort of used the quote from you of the, yeah, if, it's good for players to voice their opinion and challenge their coaches. Just wondered when, in your career, when you're at sort of different stages, when you voice an opinion, was that opinion in terms of a reaction into something that a coach was putting on you? And where were then the differences where you were being proactive yourself, that you wanted to affect positive change? And what were the sort of dynamics around those kind of two very different areas where you possibly would have been voicing an opinion? Yeah. Um... I've always been told that I've got little man syndrome. Obviously, only being being five six, probably at a push. Can say five five and a half, but <laughs> um, I've I've never been I've never been shy to um to voice my opinion and and to share what if it's for the good of the team and good good for myself. 
um, then then I've always I've always openly said what was also on my mind. And at times I've probably done that um, the wrong way. I remember I know Drew alluded to a couple of his stories, what he's been through, and all the rest of it. I remember when I was at um, when I was at Rotherham and Alan Neil, who's the assistant manager at Sheffield United now, he's, he was my manager at Rotherham for the period. And I remember we played Ipswich away, and um, they had a fantastic team, and they were flying, and um, we were struggling at the bottom of the league, and went went away to Portman Road, we lost four nil. And I probably had one of the best games of my career. I remember like I, I tore Fabian Wilness a new one, like I turned him inside out. And he took me off after about 60, 70 minutes. I mean, we were four nil down, but I got a standing ovation from from the Portman Road faithful. And that stuck with me. And that, instead of sitting on the bench, I walked straight down the tunnel um, into the dressing room. And he come in after the game, obviously he had a pop at me when I was like, you ain't got a scoop what you're doing. I'm our best player, I was the best player on the pitch. This and yeah, and looking back at the time, I thought I was doing the right thing, but now looking back, that was definitely the wrong thing because there's ways and means that you can approach things. And I wish that I'd have kept my mouth shut and maybe not shut, but I would have said it in in a different way and maybe pulled him on a one to one basis and and had that conversation in a different way. So it's, I've had loads of situations like that where I wish I I addressed them properly. And as I got older, I got more mature. Um, and I think that's important that every day, every every week, every month, every year, you're just progressing and learning. And, and for me, and that's what I've been trying to teach my boys at, at Colchester, that, yep, yeah, there's all the ups that you get, there's double the amount of downs. And that's how football is. And you've got to learn to how to how to handle those situations and all the rest of it. So for me, this year, in my like teaching these boys not on how to be better players but better people and how to how to handle the, the downs as well as being good when it's up it's, it's it's the downs you get a lot unless you're a top Premier League player and even then they, they still have their, their difficult times but when you're in the lower leagues and stuff it's, you, there is a lot of downs and it's about how you handle those situations Fantastic. Cheers, Steve. Joanne. Steve, something. Can I just jump because he made a really interesting point, and I just thought it'd be stupid not to elaborate on it. Brilliant, Jamal. When you said about the, the Ipswich story, and you, you well, I mean, I've, I've walked down the tunnel, I've kicked water bottles, I've done all that stuff. For, for me, it was absolute selfish behaviour. It was all about me and my needs, and I'm the man. And you, how dare you take me off? What I what I realise, and, and and what what I see a lot working with cultures is that that selfishness is created by the culture and, yep. and I see it in sales when I work with the sales guys you know I've had it there the best salesman in the office he's selfish he doesn't care about the culture I said stop you've created that you have created that he doesn't know any different he'll make you money he'll perform but now don't ask for humility when you've created a culture where it's dog eat dog so mm -hmm. it's really difficult I know you can look back I, I can look back I, I don't have regrets about those incidents I go I was set up for it. Like, how do you possibly, you're not allowed to, do you know what I mean? I don't, I went around Milan, but. Um. I think I mean, it's, it's perfect. Yes. Yeah, so before I can see Anthony's ready to jump in, but I was going to kind of frame it for you, Anthony, that uh, we've seen just chatting with three guys, you know, we've got three very different personalities that we're dealing with here. Um, as a coach, we sort of now move on to coaching and understanding the individuals you're working with. I mean, you're working with up to 15, 25. Uh, let's, let's not, let's be fair here. It's, it's very difficult to kind of understand those individuals. Or maybe what Drew is alluding to there is that if you're creating the right environment, that is, that is the, the, the starting point there. So as a coach, you know, you were just dealing with these three personalities, how would you sort of go about creating that environment so these you three could flourish amongst 15 to 20 other guys yeah I, I, for me like i said i i i'm just listening to what the guys have said and the reason i, I was actually chomping to sort of jump in at that point was that's reality it's a reality of life but it's also a reality of the cruel sport that we work in football and football can be cruel and i think What's really important for me is, is a knowledge of yourself. Because Drew, both of you guys, Drew and Jamal, just talked about culture. 
if, if you go into a particular environment and you're not suited to it, because of the way the game is, a lot of people stay in it. They endure something, but they're never going to be truly fulfilled or happy. And they're definitely not going to be at peace. Now, I know I went through a period of time when I was coaching at Tottenham, when it came to retain or release time, and I changed my personality changed from being what I would classify as happy, let's keep going, let's give you as much technical detail as I can, let's work with you individually, to someone who became cold, aloof, almost depressed. And that was because I was being driven to release players that I actually thought would do well in the game if we met their individual needs, rather than thinking about their social economic status, which is how some people were signed. So from an integrity perspective, it put me in a di difficult position. And then I'm sitting in the room opposite, you know, on the other side of the table saying to somebody or sitting while somebody's being told, unfortunately, we can't offer you a contract. And then conversely, I'm sitting down watching people who should not be offered a contract saying, congratulations, you've been offered a two. And I'm sitting there going, because I had nothing to say. That's tough, especially when it's happening twice a year. And it impacts on everything. It impacts on not just your life in and around the club, you, you bring it home. It impacts on your relationships away from the club. And I'd like to think that what all of that has taught me is to be peaceful. And if I don't agree with something, and, and, and I've got some good friends, like, I don't know if you guys know Danny Lynch, who was at Kick It Out, but people like Roisin and Troy at Kick It Out, where you have to be honest. And I know we're in the middle of a situation at the moment, which coronavirus and Black Lives Matter pandemic, but it's people not being honest that puts us in this situation. It's people who are not being congruent with their behaviours and being almost... Um, going along with the flow of what other people or the majority are doing so from a coach's perspective for me culture starts with the management the leadership and it should be judge us by our deeds judge us how we act and treat other people on a not how we treat them every so often how we treat them on a minute by minute basis because if we treat our employees because Everyone's a stakeholder in a club. Parents, players, I'm going to say the cleaners, and I don't mean that to be rugged the grounds people, the caterers, the coaching staff, medical staff, sports science staff, everybody's a stakeholder and everybody should have a voice and be able to use that voice without any fear. And my experience says in certain environments that I've been in, there's a great culture of fear because they know that they can be replaced quite easily. And whilst you've got academy systems and maybe you know, financial rewards aren't that great in particular environments, you must become expendable. And then you know, the leaders of the club know that if they put a job out tomorrow, they know they'll get a thousand applications, but will they get the right people that will actually enhance the organization, whether it's football or business? to be able to support the development, which is ultimately what we're there for, of the young people that are coming through the structures and turning them into, whether it's men or women in, in, in both games, you know, that's what we're there for. So I feel quite passionate about it. And, and as you can see, and I'm, just, to, just to start this, I would say that I'm more than what I do. I am definitely more than my job title. And I went through a period, and the guys have alluded to this, where. If I put them in priority, my family comes first, my friends come second, my colleagues come third, and then my job. It sounds crazy. For a long time, I had that totally upside down. Partly because of ego, partly because of when things don't go right in the home, it's easy to see you know, things from outside. And I put myself in situations where I felt like I allowed myself to be manipulated but didn't have the confidence and the strength to deal with it properly. And we learn lessons. We learn lessons. And, and I'll come back to what I said earlier, you know, I walk into places now and I'm sitting here 
and this is going to sound really crazy, and please don't think I'm mad, but on my right-hand side, I've got John Gittens. Next to him, I've got Hugo Hekiog. I've got um, Cyril Regis, you know, and I've got Steve Brown, all in this room sitting with me right now, because what they have taught me over the years is that we all need support systems. And it's important to recognize that integrity has to be at the top of those. Steve, can I, can I, because I think there's some brilliant points. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah. You've just triggered so much in me thinking about it. I'm often asked, you know, how, how have you set this business up, Drew? How do you earn what you earn by doing this? I said, you know, there's, one, there's only one thing, fear. The, fear is like the racism debate at the moment. You, you, cannot, you cannot change racism in the hearts of men. You cannot change fear in the hearts of men. It's the same thing. It, it, it's such a powerful energy. I believe that a lot of the racism is fear-based ignorance. So the fear, what I see in football is fear. It's the one common thing. It, and, and I feel like at times I've got a PhD on it because sitting in rehab, homeless, bankrupt, lost everything. I sat with a pen and paper first night and had to report to the lounge the next morning with three guys and a head therapist and I had to write on my current uh, state financially, career and family. Sleeping in my car, wife kicked me out. Oh, 80 grand in debts, don't have a job. Um, was it fear, career, money? 22 clubs I'm, uh, in 17 years, unemployable. And I remember sitting there and the fear lifted. It, looking back now, of course, it was, it was the death of the ego. My ego needed to die that way so harshly. I don't believe everyone needs to go through that. That was my journey. It was an ego death, a collapse of ego. Um, and it was the most enlightening, freeing thing I've ever had in my life. Uh, I can't replicate that moment because I've started, I, what I did was then get anchor back to who I was, who I am at source. And then all of it, very quickly, the money comes back, the house comes back, new family, that all comes back. I work daily, hour and morning, prayer, meditation, gratitude list to keep my ego at bay. All day I'm aware of ego. One of the business leaders said to me the other day, he goes, mate, I, I didn't realize that everything I'm doing in this place is ego, but I never, I used to think I haven't got an ego. I haven't got an ego, but the way you described it Drew, is it's fear. It's fear. Ask yourself fear. And that is all I'm doing. Players laugh with me when they were going back into the clubs of lockdown. How are you doing? Feel awesome, man. Feel awesome. Cause I'm away from football. But I know the minute I walk back in within two or three straight back into it, the players gossiping in the dressing room cause they're all shit themselves. They're all dead. It's insecure. Everyone's insecure. So they're all, the staff were terrified about staying up, going down, middle of the tape. Fear, fear, fear. And, and, and my belief is that until that's tackled, again, like these guys were saying, the racism, how do we really tackle it? How we tackle the mental health epidemic and the performance epidemic, the loss of the creative talent who cannot step past the 18 to 20 age gap, who can't step in there. It's fear. And, you know, I know there's, that's just not taught on the bit. I've done B and A licenses. That I think you should be tagging on a year to that because what you find is I've got mates with stellar careers at the moment, just finishing stellar careers, done their A licenses. They would last two minutes as coaches Great. playing golf with a couple of the other week. So game experience off the scale emotionally yeah. at some point they had to stop feeling because the game you want to feel in this game, oh, get ready, get ready. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Guys have got snooze tucked in the top lip. This stuff, if anyone taken snooze, it's tobacco pouches. Epidemic at the moment. Groundsman at the Premier League, pissed off because he keeps cutting up the mowers, these little bags. I've taken this stuff, a strong one, two minutes max. You're tranced. I see the guys, the snooze like that, and they're playing with it just to escape the truth because the truth is fear. And I can't go to my man and say, boss, I'm shitting myself, aren't you? No, I'm, I'm good. I'm, 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 I'm shitting myself. Shitting myself I'm not good enough. Shitting myself about my contract length. Shitting myself. Really? You can't have that chat. I, I, I won't name him. A highly, highly decorated head of youth. Probably one of the best this country's ever produced. Speaking to a friend of mine the other day, who's an enlightened guy, and he said to him, do you know who you are? A, a, yeah, a coach. A co no, 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 forget all that. Who, who are you? He didn't answer it. Couldn't answer it. How do you, you who am I? I, I? I'm blessed. I found it at rock bottom. Who am I? Hugely kind, hugely compassionate, 
hugely empathetic, wildly driven. Um, you know, that's who I am. So forget the coaching. That, that's easy, that bit. This is the hard bit. And this is what I see coaches aren't upskilled in. And, and that trauma work for ex-players before they come coaches to work through all the times they had to sell out on themselves, couldn't be themselves. Because until you do that, you've got no chance. Jamal, I think uh, Drew's putting you uh, in, a, in a hell of a spot there. Uh, as someone who's coming through their, through their coaching badges, as one of those sort of players, you're making that transition. I mean, obviously some of those challenges that you're facing, they, they must ring true to you. Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, if you had asked me a year ago if I, if I wanted to be a coach, it would, it would have been absolutely not. And um, I've got, I've, I must say that I'm... That fear, that fear comment that he's just said is um is massive because um for the last five, six, seven years I have been absolutely shitting myself about the next stage of my life and what I want to do. And I'm not saying that I'm gonna go and be the next Anthony Ferguson and have a stellar coaching career and I'm gonna be whoever and I'm gonna be coaching for the next 15, 20 years. I can't say that I'm still finding myself on that next stage of my life. Um, but what I will say is that I've been lucky enough that the transition has been, well, was a smooth one so far. Um, I fell into it, like I said, it was a call out of the blue and I grabbed it with both hands and, and here I am today. I, it was a great experience, and but not experiences are great ones. And, and sometimes we have to go through these things. So. Right now, I'm I'm in a blessed position. I'm 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 lucky and all the rest of it. Um, but who knows what the future holds? I'm still trying to find that next. Because for for 20 years of my life, I was I was lucky. I was I was in a bubble, and footballers are in a bubble. You get to train in at what half eight, nine o'clock every day. You have a bit of brekkie. You go in the gym, you train. You're done by half twelve, one o'clock. The rest of the day's yours. I was in a bubble. I was lucky. I was I was earning great money. I uh, was very fortunate. Now it, it's almost like it comes to it comes to a halt, and it's like, what do I do now? But and I've seen so many of my pals, like Drew said, I've seen so many of my pals are like, Jammer, like, um, what are you gonna do? I'm I'm struggling. I don't know what I'm gonna do, and all the rest of it. And and it's hard to to have those answers unless you find those answers from within. And um, and so you start asking yourself those 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 honest questions. What is it that you really want to do? What are you doing with yourself? And it, it, it is difficult um, because, like I said, if you'd asked me a year ago, like I was still thinking I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and squeeze another year out. But um, it's just one of those things. I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm in the blessed position. I, I, I fell into this role. Um, but, but who knows what the future holds. Hopefully I can continue this and I can progress in the right way and stay on this pathway. But um, Drew, like, like, Drew's a very, he's, he's lucky at, in, in some ways that he's found himself, but he had to go through tough situations and, and kudos to you, Drew, for like actually looking at yourself in the mirror and, and saying like, that's, your story is unbelievable. I'm sitting here like with goosebumps on my arms, honestly, mate, like um, to have that honesty and like not eat just with yourself, but to share it with, with the panel like this, I think, I think that's a, that's a massive hat off to you because um, yeah. what footballers are as well, footballers, uh, a liars. There's so many footballers out there that you will you have a conversation, something so stupid like what was Drew saying, and they'll like you you'll know the truth yourself and they'll and they'll tell you the complete opposite thing like why are you lying about that? But to tell your honest your story like that so so blase, that's that's unbelievable. And some may say it's because you're doing so well now, but even still it, it's embarrassing and, and it's and it, and it's hard and all the rest of it. But what, you, you telling your story like that Honestly, like my hat really goes off to you. Do you know, do you know what, Jamal? It's interesting you said that the reason I'm doing so well now is because what I learned in rehab is I have nothing. When everything externally got stripped from me, when the shirt, the name had finished on the back of the shirt, the money had gone, the wife had gone, everything had gone. And I'm sitting there. That was, that, was, that was my journey. And I know, so I was only left with me. Then I had to ask, well, who, who am I? I haven't got a clue who I am. I'm the number nine. I'm this guy. I'm... No, you're not any of those things. Who are you? And that was incredible. Um, and, and the reason I've slowly built back to where I am today is because of that fundamental question. I, I've got a huge moral compass. When I sat in a dressing room, and like you, I, I, 
I would hear black lads and the black guys be racially abused in the dressing room. And I'd stand up for them and, and against the other white guys because my moral compass, and, and that was always difficult for me to carry that moral compass because it's lonely, it's, it's, it's really difficult. And, but all of a sudden, eight years ago, when I bottomed out, who are you? You've got strong morals. So you have to follow that path, come what may. And, and that's what I just try and do. Uh, and, and I think this is the bit, I think, of, you're right, players are liars. When I was asked to go and consult a league club last year with the manager and an old friend of mine, and one of the first things the coaches say, okay, do you agree with this, Drew? Um, all footballers are X, I won't use the word. So we have to, that, that's what we have to know, don't you, Drew? I said, it's the sickest comment I've ever heard. I said, no, they're not. They're good guys who, who, who've lost themselves. So we mm. need to lead them back to themselves. What do they need? Love, understanding, care. They need to be spoken to with respect. They need to be asked what they need. If he's 35, ask him if he wants to do gym work. If he doesn't, send him home early. Let him go and see the kids. No problem. Look, you know, it's, it's funny you say that. When I, when I, when I alluded to Keith Carroll being the best, best mm. manager I've played on, and literally, like, what I said earlier, he was probably, and he'll probably tell you himself, one of the worst coaches <laughs> like I, I've worked under, but he surrounded himself with good coaches, with Colin yeah. Lee, Colin Ferguson, West. Ferguson, Klopp. Yeah, they, they, they honestly, like, they were brilliant for him, and he used to stand on the side and he used to just analyse, like, why isn't he not training well? What's, like, what's going on? And he used to come around, Drew, how are you today? Miss wow. like, mm. I mean, like, need a couple of days. Mate, I went to Carlisle with him. And honestly, we didn't have a midweek game. After the game on a Saturday, I wasn't back in until Thursday. Like, and I know at the age of 35, that's probably what your body needs in order. But how many managers do you know that will give somebody that much freedom and that much trust? Like, you just don't see it anymore. It's, just, it's unbelievable. It's brilliant. Because of fear. Yeah, yeah. Fear, and they don't know it's called fear. Yeah. They, if you said to the coaches, you're afraid, I, I said it to a group of coaches in the first team office. When I was, guys, fear, I can smell it in here. Stink, stinks of fear. I'm not scared. Come on, man. You're not yeah. scared? Six games, you're done. You, you're sacked. Let's just put that out there. Mm. Are you scared of that fact? Well, I, you've got to be terrified by that. Like, but that's okay. So would I be. Now, you have to work through that energy because whether you like it or not, Guys down in the dressing room can feel it, smell it, sense it. You walk into a room, they can oh, hear it. The fear. It's amazing, Drew. When you, when you walk in, everyone talks to you. That, that lad's a bad egg. He's not a bad egg. He's a winner. And you know what? He's realised he's realized that you're full of fear. He's just cut you loose. So now he'll get you sacked. He'll see you off. He, he, his contract's fine. Because I've been in the dressing room and think, we'll get him sacked. You know the score, Jamal. You think, yeah. we'll get this manager done. We'll get, get him done out of the building in a couple of months. Done. And that's a tragedy. <laughs> it's a tragedy, right? So, so, so. My, my uh, I was going to just jump in there. Sorry, Anthony. We're just uh, getting one or two questions coming through. Okay. Um, sort of, yeah, just to keep it in that sort of area before moving on. Um, question here from Barrington Todd. Sort of says a quick hello to you all. Um, and sort of, how are you going to get coaches to understand the importance for pastoral care for young players from 11 to 20? Well, I, I, this links to what I was going to say anyway, so brilliantly. Thanks, thanks very much for the question, Barry. In fact, I, I, I know Barry because I said we used to play together when we were young and he, he was a top quality, two-footed, and I'm going to say it like that, not because he can walk with two feet, but he could play off both feet equally. Um, and what an amazing talent he was, played at Orient and at Spurs himself. Um, I think one of, one of the things that, you guys touched on in that and hopefully it will connect Steve so bear with me um, culture fear anxiety I've heard the words I've used it myself ego it's all about the self it's also about knowing yourself and and one thing that happened to me my, my greatest mentors were my mum and dad and especially my dad because my dad used to do things like you know, Anthony, if your grades drop, you're not going to football. Now, I was relatively consistent, but then I got complacent. And the, the one time, the one time, I'll never forget it, that my grades dropped. I got ready. I was ready to go. And, and, and Dad, if, when you watch this, you will remember it because I was ready to go, all bags packed by the door. And my dad was in his, in his pajamas. 
And I said, Dad, are we not going? He said, well, hold on a minute. All that time ago, what did I tell you? If your grades are dropped, what's the consequence? And as a result of that, my grades never dropped after that. It was because I wanted to play football, but my education became important. Now, the reason I'm using that as an example is doing a qualification doesn't give you the education. You have to do the qualification, which then links to the time you spend on the grass. The time on the grass is when you learn, because that's when you're going to have players tell you that it's not as good as it should be. That's when players are going to say, I really enjoyed that. That's how you're going to learn. And, and what for me happens is people rush the process. You can't rush it. So Jamal didn't become a professional. Drew didn't become a professional because they automatically woke up one day and said, right, I'm a professional. They played ball in, in school. They played ball for their district. And then they had to do numerous hours outside of their training to be as good as they could be. Now, the subjective part comes when you step through the door because everybody's opinion is going to differ. And until you have some form of measure where it's not just down to one person, so hopefully, Barry, this is, I'm going to answer your question. It has to be a collective process. And we have a responsibility that when someone comes through the door, if they were good enough to come through the door, we have to look internally at why they're not making those next steps. We can't just blame the player because it's easy to say they're not good enough. I had it at non-league. I used to hear, you hear it now where the, the team have lost and the, the first thing the managers say is they're not good enough. Well, hold on a minute. Look in the mirror. What have you done before this to make them ready? And I think until people start looking at a holistic approach to developing people, and I'm saying that's why we as coaches have to be always involved in learning, Steve. And the learning takes place not just by the player, but also the parents need to be educated. The, the players and the coaches need to be on a place of continual development in order to stay ahead of the young people that are coming through the system. And until we do that, we're not going to have that process. So for me, it takes place on a daily basis, having these conversations, honest conversations with integrity, where people can look inside themselves and say, how courageous am I to try something different? So I remember when I first started doing sessions, which was, okay, you guys set the picture. People looked at me as though I was mad. When I then adjusted the pitch and said, well, okay, let's, what happens if we make it bigger? People said, yeah, but that's not going to work. That is now a common approach. Player ownership, players being involved in their own learning and development. And until we can, as coaches, can say, let me listen, let me hear what you're saying and really take it on board, that's when we go forward. And I'm, that's why I'm happy to be at Wimbledon because we're heavily into player ownership, heavily into self-managed athletes, and our culture is about being a nationally recognized development environment not a development academy because it's the culture that matters and that has to be top of the list and drew um before you un unmute your before you unmute yourself drew um yeah i'm sort of happy yeah to take continue that thread there from anthony but sort of maybe sort of add on top of that elements of uh, this question from nicholas wright but obviously in regards to cultures being in an elite environment whereby winning and development is essential for livelihood. Uh, how would you go about maintaining egos of players so they can push themselves to new levels, but also maintaining their mental health? There's a, a lot for you to chew on there, I think. I'm not, I'm not upselling here, but I'm, it's been five months in the making. It's 27 years in the, in the, in the process. I'm creating a, an online community at the moment. We launch later this year where We'll be discussing all of these topics, interviews with live players, exclusive kind of be flying, sitting with players, digging into the bones of this stuff, forums, parents, the parent journey, sitting down with two or three parents whose sons have come through the academy, who I've then worked with when they're falling out at 19. A subject ego, we come back to it. So misunderstood. I hear it chucked around all the time on Sky Sports. Ego, ego. You know, someone said to me the other day, you need ego, you need, you need ego. And I said, you don't know what ego means. I said, you don't need ego. You, don't, you didn't come into the world with ego. He came in a beautiful child, light in his eyes, creative, spontaneous. I've got a new son, he's 18 months. There's no ego in place. The ego is as he starts to grow through four or five, the ego development happens. He starts to get a sense of self in the world. So his, his, his sense of self is, 
I already see my son now fiercely aggressive. He's not getting his own way. He wants those bricks. And wow, powerful. You're watching that. Then he'll get his sense of what, where am I in the world? That develops. Players don't need ego. Players need belief. And they come into the world with belief. Ego is the protective shell. Imagine a tortoise grows this shell. Ego is, look at me, I'm the man, I'm this. How dare you take me off, walk down the tunnel. That's all ego. But it's created by a survival mechanism to stay in the game. The original belief that Jamal had when you just gave him the ball, da -da 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 goal, da -da -da -da, that's belief. That's just me being me. So it's keeping players close to me being me. How do you do that? That's down to one thing. The leader absolutely understanding his ego. And people will break down Jurgen Klopp and they'll look at the tactics and the Genga pressing. I, I, I work with a lad at Liverpool. You'd never know how basic the training is. So beyond basic, Rondo, Ross Rondo, it's five guys versus two trying to get the ball back. But the difference in intensity, he's been out at four or five other clubs. He said, different world, different world. They think they're working hard. Come to our place. <laughs> the intensity's wild. Um, no ego. You're going to run and you are going to fight like for everything. You're going to claw and hunt like dogs. But then we can have a laugh. There's no problem. Klopp's ego is completely managed. He's completely, he has humility. And, and that is an energy. It's all energy. So it's why it's such a deep subject. How will it change? People don't even know what ego is. I feel sorry for them. That's the education that's needed in the BNA and pro license. I've got people close to me in my life who are some of the most decorated coach in this country. Pro license, youth award, this award. Some of the sickest individuals I've ever met. Bless them. Sick. Emotionally unwell. Badges coming out. Every qualification you'd know. But it's a really... Ego. People misunderstand ego. Players need ego. No, they don't. Players need to trust who they are at source. So if I was working with Jamal and Jamal, man, who, who are you? Who was the player? I, mate, I just I find it easy to go past people and play. I just, it's easy for me. Cool, man. We, we just got to set it up so you're doing that. Is there anything you need from me? Are we killing you? Are we, what do you need? Because when you're on it, you just, so what do you need to be you? If he doesn't get that, He's surviving in survival mode, stay in the team, dog eat dog. But that's, all, that's, that's ego. So whew, how will it be shifted? Only education, only uh, the FA really. And I know there's people in the FA at the moment who have been given the task of writing the blueprint, of drawing it up. FA know what needs to be done. They know something needs to be done. I'll be honest with you, the people that I'm hearing are there. Don't know who they are. <laughs> it's, it's Drew, Drew, that's it's a brilliant point. You've talked about education there. And, and before I, I get back to Jamal, I think the coach's job in that process is to make the person better. Whether it's on the field, off the field, in their lives, with their peers, in the community, you know, just at the, in the society at large, that is the coach's role. It's no longer just to make you technically better, which is where a lot of people focus. And, and to, I think to pick up on Nick's question, if you do the right things in terms of supporting the development of the player, hopefully they will maintain their passion and love for the game. That will be a win, winning, you know, uh, win at all costs mentality. Because what you're going to do is create a longevity in the game and recognise that, you know, 0.01% are going to make it. So on those simple laws of averages, most people won't. But your job is to create such a place, unless you're a first team manager and in the three-point game, is to create a place where those players feel comfortable with you as an individual to have tough conversations. Sorry, Jamal, mate. Um, I was going to say with Jamal, um, obviously picking up on what Anthony and, and Drew have just said, and we've got this question from Steve Smithies in uh, terms of how important are mentors and mentoring for coaches. Obviously, it's been interesting, the discussion we've had so far, and you've picked up on Keith Curl. And, you know, we've sort of, the conversation just there, not really talking about coaches who are great. Technically, it's those human skills. It was very interesting that you picked up as, you know, the great, the best coach that you've worked with and you're going to take that education from was how Keith Curl dealt with you as a person. So how is it? Yeah, of all the different coaches, what are the, 
different ways that you sort of take on board the things that you've experienced and kind of make them your own? You know, it's funny, um, that, that's a really good question. Um, because Colchester is massive on, on, on mentors and mentoring. Uh, it's a big part of the syllabus. And um, each player, um, 18s and 23s, actually has a mentor. So within the academy, um, the, the, the academy staff, we all have probably have about maybe four to six players each that we mentor, which I think is a, a fantastic tool. A player can come to you whether they're down in the dumps and struggling for form and all the rest of it, having off the field problems, on the field problems, or just having an absolute whale of a time and brilliant every week and all the rest of it. I want to continue those, those, those talks which are working for them. And it was funny, um, over the course of the year, the, the amount of boys that, like it, within my 23s that were actually struggling mentally, um, that we had to seek additional help for them and um, outside help and um, because what I was saying just wasn't enough and wasn't wasn't deep enough for them and um, football is a, a very draining can be a very draining sport and and and, and livelihood and um, because like I said I alluded to it earlier um, you have there's so many downs in football when you're in the 18s, are, are you going to get called up to play for the 23s? Are you even in the 18s team? When you're in the 23s, why am I not playing? Oh, why is a gaffer not picking me Like to be in the squad in the first team? And all, like, there's so many components that, that, that go with becoming a football player. And some of these young boys, some of the stories that they've told me and some of the, the questions that they're asking and like the worries that they've got in their head and it, it's, it's something that um, I think is massive in the game. And I don't think, I know we're trying to tackle it more now, but I still don't think we're tackling it enough. The, 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 the mental problems and distresses that some of the players that are going through, players that, are on, that are, I know that are on mega, mega money. One of my best friends is playing in the Premier League and he's on super money. And you think that would, that would solve all his problems, but it doesn't because he just wants to play in injuries and being out of the team and all the rest of it. These are the sort of things that goes through players' minds all the time. Drew's alluded to, like um, obviously going through, going through like a, a divorce and all the rest of it. Like these things are tough. Nobody knows what's going on behind closed doors, and these things are having problems with family, friends, all the all these problems. And, and for, when, what my my get out was actually getting out onto the pitch and playing. That was my get out, was going out out there onto the pitch at three p.m or in training or whatever, and that was my release. But then once that release is finished, when you get back into the change room, you get back into your car, get, walk back into the room, those problems are still there. So I think it's so important that we provide a platform for these players to be able to talk. Like I'm sure Anthony does it all the time with, with his players and his staff. And obviously Drew, Drew's created a, a business um, from it, which is fantastic. Obviously at Colchester, we've got the staff that help the players. It's massive because... Nobody knows what actually goes on behind closed doors, what's going on in everybody's mind and everybody's brain. And it, it's such a psychological sport. People think, oh, yeah, you've got the best job in the world. It is the best job in the world when things are going great. But how often is it going great? Really and truly, when you dissect football, how often is it going great? And this COVID thing, like, when, like all these players, are, like for the first week or two, it was brilliant being off. Then it's like the lack of routine and like the lack of being out and doing stuff. And you're just thinking, God, what am I going to do now? I'm bored. I've become the best house husband there is like in, in, in this lockdown. This is like, what's going on? I'm cutting the grass. I'm, I'm weeding. I'm doing the bushes. I'm doing stuff around the house. And it's like, there's only so many times that you can cut the grass and all the rest of it. And you're just trying to find time to fill the day. And all these players are going through that. Everybody's going through that and people can handle it in different situations. Some people actually really struggle with lack of routine and yeah. not, being, yeah. not going out to work and all the rest of it. It's tough. It really is tough. Yeah, there's a lot there, Anthony. I was going to say, we've been sort of throwing around this uh, yeah. idea of who are you? I was, you know, we're going to get there in terms of, yeah, sort of who you are as, as coaches. Um, and the sort of quote that I used for yourself when we were promoting this is that, you know, the situations that Jamal has sort of outlined there and what you've all outlined here is that 
you said you can't, I mean, you said it at the top as well, you can't really help others until you really know yourself. And Drew has had that sort of opportunity where he had to really strip himself down and to, to understand himself mm. and then move on from there to the next situation. I mean, to understand yourself as a, as a coach, is that, you know, you have to go through that similar situation. One, no, you put it in an order. You kind of know yourself as a human being and lots of other things before you, you I, come I, to the sort of I coaching. Know, I, know, I know this is on Anthony, but can I please, because, because I, did, I did a piece with Dom Fifield in The Guardian two years ago, and Dom asked me, he saw what I was doing with players, and he said, well, I want to do a piece. How does the game change? I said, you know, the most powerful process I've ever seen in my life is the 12-step addiction recovery process, the 12 steps. And it's not about the original AA. There's 12 steps for everything. Shoppers Anonymous, Sex Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous. That process and step four, and this is the step that I think the FA could create, and I've created a performance one around it, a fearless moral inventory. I had, it took me about three and a half months to write, and it was the most painful thing in my life. Every hurt I'd ever create caused another, every resentment I'd ever had, Every, so every harm, every resentment, every fear I'd ever had, and I just had to sit there and they were coming up, eight-year-old, 10-year-old, 27. This was lit streams of writing. And, the, and then the last one was sexual harms. Any girl I'd ever lied to, cheated on. Oh. And I had to write all of this down. I then had to work across the page. Where is my part in that fear? Where am I selfish, self-seeking and dishonest? Three and a half months to do a fearless moral inventory. And it's called a soul stripping. You are going to go in and you are going to look at every single one of your behaviours. Now, that's the juice. That's the money. That's the game changer. I ain't going to sure. And Don went, oh, can't see the FA signing up for that one, mate. I said, absolutely not. Because there ain't no hiding place. Because you know what? I see a lot of sick coaches out there who, who, are, who aren't I am that I am, that biblical line. They're not who they are. They don't live like they're demanding from another player. So you are going to have to live and honour every hurt you've caught. Strip the decks. Then you find out who you are because under all those bricks and lies and fears is you. And you lift them all off. That's who I am. That's a tough process. Six months, you could add on to the B&A licence. Six months. Mm. Sat with a psychotherapist doing that process. <laughs> Game changer, but tough, tough, tough. Drew, that's fantastic, mate. And and Steve, it's a fantastic question from you, but also the one that links to what Steve Smith has asked as well. Um, doing a person, I call it a personal inventory, Drew. That's what I call it. And it's, it's, it's the ability to find a level of honesty with yourself. And it's, it's a self-talk. And it's funny because Drew, last, like I said, the last time we saw each other was at Kaleidoscope, which is a mental health charity in, in Birmingham who do some fantastic work. But the reason I, I mentioned that is, I, I said earlier that, you know, Drew, Drew gave me a, a real talking to, and I, I gave him, I gave as good as I got. And it was kind of a sparring match, kind of, I would say Fury versus Wilder, but not the same outcome, right? Um, but, but predominantly mentoring, is about honesty, but that comes after you build the relationship. Now, the, 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 the mentoring doesn't necessarily have to be the leader, but it has to be someone who can empathize with what you're going through and have been through and potentially to go through. And I think mentoring is critical for everyone, regardless of whether it's in sport, because having a sounding board that you can speak openly and honestly about that they can then feed back to you openly and honestly creates a proper relationship. Now, since I've left the FA, I've, I, I think whilst I was there, I had a number of what I'd classify as mentors. But now as part of the elite um, coaches, heads of coaches, they, they allocate us mentors. Now, this is how funny life is. And I don't think, again, it's any coincidence. I think it's a God incident. Someone I met, what is almost now, is it 2000, 2000, 20 years ago, who was a head of education, at a, a very, very good school. His name is um, Sir, Paul, uh, Sir Paul Grant. Was, he was head of, uh, headmaster at the school. 20 years later, through no contact in between, he is now what is classified as my professional development mentor. 
Now, bearing in mind I met him 20 years ago and we had such deep, meaningful conversations then and his life experiences and my life experiences, we've now come together 20 years later and he's now digging into what I've been through and my processes. He is now opening up my mind again, and I'll say it again, to how we can be better. And I think if every player, coach, manager, regardless of position, staff member, has someone who they can go to and have real, let's say real, real conversations. Is that a good way of putting it, Drew Jamal? Real conversations. Then we're all going to improve because I'll come back to it. It's about maintaining the love of the game as opposed to a short moment in time. And I think that's the problem. Everyone focuses on how short the career is rather than thinking this is a moment in our lives that we're going to have another moment afterwards, which Jamal is going through currently and Drew is experiencing. But I would suggest that from the time we're born, we're always going through moments. The first five years, we're, we're, we're nurtured, we're supported by our parents. From five to 11, we go into junior school. We're now learning to socialize and how to navigate that system. When we leave junior school at 11 year old, where we've been told how brilliant we are, we go into secondary school, where basically you've got to fend for yourself. After that, you go into college, university, by then you've already had four careers. If you now go through football, that's to me as a fifth career. And by the time you finish that, you're thinking, well, what's my sixth? And if you process it like that, you see it differently to just say football is a short career. And I think it's mentality. It comes back to education. It comes to culture, environment. Sorry, guys, I'm getting passionate because this is what brings me my peace is because I've seen it. And having seen it, what it allows me to do is, is almost just watch as other people are going through it and think, when you're ready, come to me and we'll have a discussion about what you've just been through. And I think that's the bit that really gives me joy at the moment is, and that's not ego, it's, it's being able to just sit back and watch, watch things happen that you almost know are going to happen and being able to support people through that process. And I'm, I'm part of an F3 group and also Christians in sport. But what it does for me, because of the people in those groups who are, largely successful but a lot of them have been sacked from their jobs a lot of them have been through adversity but that's what allows them to be successful because no one learns from just getting patted on the back all the time you learn from the hard knocks and the guys on the call will tell you that so mentoring i think is absolutely critical in the networks that you have and i can't stress it enough Anthony, something. To th thank you, mate. It was such a powerful share, mate. I, you know, I always take a lot from it. And there was a word that jumped out at me. Again, I look at words and dig into them. Empathy. The number one quality of every single great leader in history is empathy. Some have it naturally. I have huge levels naturally of empathy, which is a tough burden to carry because you feel everything. I so yeah. sensitive. I feel everything. Yeah. yeah. I learn now how to manage that positively. I, I read a really powerful line, and this is why, again, it's not going to be shifted by using the wording, having a workshop on empathy. You cannot feel empathy when you've buried feelings. Mm. And this is why it's a tough process to rediscover empathy. You have to go into your feelings. And, and so when a player has the conversation with the coach, unless that coach is really aware of his emotions and feelings... You can't build intimacy, so the intimacy gap begins. Where the intimacy gap begins, selfishness grows like a young tree. We're back to the selfishness, dog eat dog, do it for myself. You know, and so it's back to the feelings, feelings, feelings. Um, yeah, uh, some guys have huge natural levels. Everyone's trying to follow Klopp and Guardiola. They have absolutely huge le natural levels, resources of, of empathy. Um, they're in their feelings. People shame their press conferences. Oh, they leave it all out there. They're just authentically feeling everything. That's why they can get it out of their players because they tap the one area, the one area that's beyond science, beyond tactics, beyond... I, I was playing golf on Tuesday with two guys, probably about 700 Premier League games in that four ball. I have none of them. But there was... <laughs> and the guys who were sitting afterwards and they went, 
interesting conversation. I didn't start it. It was, they've never learned anything that's improved them from a coach beyond the age of 18. Yeah. 34 was the youngest, 36 was the oldest. Stellar, stellar careers. That's Not that. learned one thing. Now, that's no one can say that's wrong because that's their feelings. Now, yeah. I went, they said, did you, Drew? I went, oh, what a question. I said, no. Once I'd been upskilled from eight on tactics and how to be a target man and receiving it and backing in. And once I'd learned all that stuff, showing, showing the center half one, once I'd done all that, done by probably 17, 18, I didn't learn one more thing till 33. Wow. Wow. And so that's all of us in that four ball. And those guys, you know, 40, 50 grand a week, some of them for the last few years. What are there is the truth. And wow. Jim Al's touched on it. Because wow. what they needed, and one of their teammates who's 29 who I started working with, when he rang me, I said, you don't need me, man. You, you fly in. You play over your country. All's good. He said, it's not all good. I've still got 20%. I said, yeah, I'm sure. He said, I said, where does that lie? He said, just... I just can't be myself, can't really be myself on, on a match day in the Premier League. I said, what does that look like? He said, for me, it looks like, I, won't, I might give it away, but how he plays his game, stepping out with the ball being, okay, why not? Well, because you do and you give it away and you're like, yeah. He said, and tactically, you, 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 sit, you do it in the 11 v 11 the day before, well, we don't want you doing that. And I said, so you, my friend, are going to have to take the, the big leap, the leap of your Luis Suarez is and he's where the big dogs reside. The big, big dogs, they don't listen to nobody. No one. Raheem Sterling, who's become a colossal man, shared something so powerful the other year when the journalist dared to ask him, what's this new vein of form you've found? He said, no, I've not found any vein of form. I've been scoring goals since I was eight years of age. Then, at 19, I started listening to too many people. 20, 21. He said, now, three words of advice for youngsters. Number one, listen to nobody. Number two, listen to nobody. Number three, listen to nobody. I tweeted it. There was outrage. This is disc I said, I haven't said this. Raheem Sterling said you. You're the same people loving Raheem Sterling. Now you're it's not on me. He's come out with this. But it scared the life out of all of those coaches who think they're affecting players. What Raheem Sterling would basically was saying, I was always good enough. Just, just needed a bit more belief, a bit more love to stay true to who I was. He's found one of the ultimate mentors in Guardiola who can acknowledge those feelings and the passion. and the God, he does something which is beautifully powerful as a leader the same guy who's coming out and being our mainstay of the racism debate goes into an england camp and grips a player by the throat awesome i want that guy in my camp i'm not going to send him home i'm going to go that's fantastic you two come on in you come i love you do that because that same fight i need at wembley in three nights time but come on guys like we've all been there i've stamped on a couple people head but it's all good like i love that energy you're a winner Absolute winner. Um, but he goes back to, to, to uh, Man City and gets those needs met back there um, by a great leader. So, yeah, ramble on. I'll shut up. Um, just to bring uh, Jamal in, um, we've, uh, yeah, we're kind of running out of time. So we've come up with somewhere where we can uh, sort of wrap this up along the lines of, yeah, probably won't be as, as cruel, but feel free to, to answer the question who you are as coaches. I know with Jamal, you're very much going through that process. And it's sort of the interesting area is then sort of, well, how are you now sort of developing your own values as a coach that you've sort of spent the last 20 years, your focus has been very much on yourself. Now you're having to serve this group of 18 to 23 year olds and whether you believe what we've just said, whether it's something you believe in yourself that there's not really a great deal in terms of technicians that you can give these players as a coach. So your, your role now is very much as a listener. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I just think, like, um, I know I've alluded to Keith Curl, like, um, so many times um, on this chat, um, but there's many other coaches that I've, that I've worked with, worked under, good and bad. And, um, and those experiences, I think, it's brilliant to work with the bad ones, just as, not bad, but ones that you don't take to it as well as I think the ones that you do take to um, because that's how I want to mould myself as a coach, as a manager, whatever whatever path I go down. Um, I, th I think it's, it's, it's vitally important because what I can do is I can, if I take a little bit from him and a little bit from him and take a little bit what I don't want from him, then that's going to hopefully put me in good stead to be where I want to be. Um, 
and I think it's so important. I think Anthony said it earlier, is about building relationships with your players. I think that's so important to understand that the needs, the wants, and um, that the players that the players require. I think that's the that's the the only way you're going to get the very best out of them is understanding the players that you have. Not every player is the same, and that and that is tactically and technically, and also socially. Do you know what I mean? I think it's so important that we understand the players socially as well. So for me, like I, I'm not, I'm never going to be one of those coaches that stand on the side and rant and rave and point and scream and say, "Go there, do this, control, put him in." I'm not one of them. Like I'm one of them that before the game at half time, I'll give information and I'll try and lead them the right way. If you're not doing it, then you can come and sit next to me and give somebody else a chance. Um, but that's the type of type of coach that I can see myself being because that's the coaches that I appreciated when I was playing. Um, I never reacted well to being screamed at and all the rest of it. I didn't, like, it didn't really bother me so well, but it was just in one ear and out the other. Um, but the ones that I did appreciate were the ones that took the time to understand that what I was trying to do, what I was trying to see, and all the rest of it, and understood me as a player and as a person. Um, and that's the way that I want to see myself as a coach. Brilliant. Thanks, Brilliant. Cheers, Brilliant. Jamal. Let's Brilliant. move it on to next with, with Drew uh, in terms of who you are as a coach and you sort of mentioned there's been words that have uh, sort of sparked things in your in your mind now. I don't know whether there's one word that you sort of mentioned in sort of the last time we spoke to you is um, authenticity. So how is you, who you are as a coach, how do you sort of create that authenticity about you as a, as a coach that the people you're working with can, can buy into? Well, again, there's no quick road to that. It's... Um... You know, there's no quick road to, to, to finding out who you are. Uh, that, that, that moral inventory, again, this, this thing that I'm not upselling, this thing I'm creating online, we do all of this stuff. Because, you know, I, I've been asked to go into a few clubs now and do coach education. I did a day at Hearts in Scotland, the academy staff, and it was hugely powerful. Craig Levine sat on it and, and, and was very kind. And I, I was nervous talking to the first team staff. It's one thing with the academy staff, but when the, when the first team staff come in, it were completely ingrained in the system and ingrained in, 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 in their fear without realizing, but I was able to penetrate through that fear and give them objectives. Um, I, I did a clip that went down really well, authenticity. I took a clip from Guardiola in the, in the Man City thing and a clip from Simon Grayson in the, in the Sunderland thing where he had the whiteboard up the day before the first game and he went through 20 points. You see all the, the boys just at the back, just sitting there like that on their phones after the first couple of points. Number point one, get the crowd on side. We're at home. You know what the fans are like. Point two, out of possession. You can see all the... Bo- and, I, and I was smiling, going, God, I've sat in a million of meetings with them. And I did, ran that. And I'm not knocking Simon Grace in any way. This is a great... It highlights a point. And then point two was Guardiola on his knees in the middle of the dressing room. Play with courage. And he's just like the emotion. And you have the eyes of warriors on him. So, with the greatest respect to the lads at Sunderland comparing them against the players at Man City Company, Silva, Aguero, top players, and their eyes didn't leave Aguero. Whereas the eyes in Grayson's room, phone, floor, lost them. One difference, feelings. Feelings and emotion, authenticity. I am that I am. Um, it's funny when, you know, there's a big spiritual gap in, 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 in society, but certainly in football, in business, a spiritual gap. I, I'm not religious. Uh, I've looked at the face. I've done a silent retreat with monks for 48 hours, seven years ago. It was a powerful experience. You'll find yourself in silence. And Christ, some of the voices that go through, yeah, I've got sexual shit running through my mind. I'm on about killing people and hurting people. What the, 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 but the truth, um, powerful. But, so I've looked, but if you look at the origins of all the great face, they're all the same. They're all from the Buddha to Christ. I am that I am. <laughs> don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. Be honest. Do the next right thing, um, spirit, spiritually enlightened, and it's no more than being in the moment. So in, if in the moment someone offends me, I'm going to say that offended me. I won't sit on it for four days. And so authenticity, the toughest thing to get. I think with a lot of these buzzwords, empathy, emotional intelligence, they're chucked around, but I don't think people realize how tough it is to really start to master these things. It's incredibly tough because it means you are absolutely back in touch with your feelings. And you know what? Life hurts. Every night when I put, put my head on the pillow, is this the night my daughter dies in her sleep? 
Is this the night my son gets a terminal illness? Is this the night I wake up with tomorrow with a terminal cancer? Might be. So that fear is rampant because you're in your feelings, the truth of life. And for a player, the truth is you might break your leg, you might play bad today, um, they're going to boo you. you, you. So, you, you know, authenticity is nothing more than being completely in line with the truth of life, completely vulnerable and, you know, all we've got is sweat, really. So, yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. It's all on you and T. So, uh, yeah. Wow. Listen, um, Jamal, Drew, if, if I was sitting and, and I always, and I'm doing what Drew's just talked about, I'm almost stepping out and thinking, if I was viewing this as a podcast or a webinar, all the, the notes that I mostly would have taken, I've taken notes in any way, but how many notes would I have taken and how would I then be able to apply it in the various environments that we, I go into? Um, and I think this has been very deep. It's, there's, there's a sense of passion, but there's also a sense of pride in the way people are speaking. And I'm going to use the word with authenticity. And, and I think I'm proud to have been part of this because this, is, this transcends football and sport and it, and, it, and it goes into a wider realm. So for me, I'm grateful. I'm generally grateful, like, like Drew's just eloquently put it. I don't necessarily think about it before I go to sleep, but when I get up, I normally give thanks twice. One, for being able to wake up and two, being able to get up. And it's something that we may take for granted, but opening the curtains and seeing the blue sky becomes great gratitude number three and giving thanks because that's not me, that's someone that's given me another day to operate. I'd like to think in terms of who I am, in terms of working with people in football, is I think I'm quite courageous because I'm, I'm encouraging people to try things, take risks, learn from the adversity, um, I do have a phrase called rules are for fools. Wise men use them as guidelines. And some people take that literally, and it's not meant to be that, but it's supposed to allow you the freedom to be able to try things and see what happens. As a coach, I think you have to have an inner peace to be able to see people for who they are, but also see yourself for who you are. Don't be afraid to stand up for what's right even if you get chastised for it because good will prevail over evil and everything will happen in its time. So I like to think that as a coach and the people I work with, like I said, I, I feel blessed to have some fantastic people. I don't call them staff, some people around us who are really conscientious, but they also really think about the long-term development of the people they work with. And I feel blessed to be in that environment with them. And it's got to be that you're a work in progress and trying to improve daily. And if, if you're doing that, you, you will be successful and you will not be your job title. Fantastic, Anthony. Thank you very much. I think that's um, yeah, a good point to wrap it up today. I must say we'll take a break because it doesn't really feel as if we're anywhere close to uh, finishing this discussion. So it'd be great to have... Yeah, Anthony, Drew and Jamal all back with us sometime in the future um, yeah, to continue on, on this topic. But for today, guys, thank you really much for your, for your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Steve. And thanks, thanks to everybody guys. for tuning in. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.